Welcome to part six of the Compero, where we're going to be showing the problems with modern vehicles that have center diffs or clutches which do not fully lock. We're going to be using the Defender as an example to illustrate the point, but this problem is not specific to all Defenders or all Land Rovers, and we're going to show you exactly how things work using models and the driving techniques to work around the problem. Please watch at least part one of the series where I introduce the vehicles and also every other part will demonstrate the vehicles, highlight specific problems and then explain what those problems are. So we'll start off with the Defender and it's going to attempt a slippery climb. You've seen this on earlier videos but this is early in the day and it's very very wet and no car is going to make it it's really just a tire thing you can see that's it it's out of traction now the interesting thing starts when it goes backwards and what we see there is that slides sideways quite significantly there and then back over this rut um, it slides sideways again and look it is off camber but that is a lot of sliding sideways and there is a reason for that which we're going to get to now this is a side view of the car on one of its runs and you can see that front wheel locks and the rear wheels just continue rotating. Now here's another run, this was after all the other cars had gone through but I'm putting it right next to the first run. So drive gives it a decent go, car gets a long way up and again we see the same problem. We go back and those front wheels lock and the car just slides fronts rotate rear not so much and now we can look at it from the side that bit's all good and now it's time to go back we've failed a hill climb F look at that fronts just locking in it's not a cross axle thing here both front wheels are locked and yet we're sliding back and those back wheels should be providing braking force and it just doesn't work. Okay, so I'll we'll gear up for another run and let's see what happens this time. A little bit of wheel spin on takeoff, so it's so slippery. Does really well to get as far as it does and brakes on. Does manage just to hold on the hill, but when it starts coming back for a bit of momentum again, front axle locks this time the driver is modulating the brakes a bit trying to turn downhill but is unsuccessful and remember that's turning downhill the other cars as you'll see will manage to actually turn uphill so here's the lc300 doesn't even quite get as far as the defender that's probably a momentum and driver commitment thing tires all pretty much the same goes back and you don't see the same sort of wheel locking there either Goes for another go, straight up and gets a little bit further this time. That tree on the right is really just not going to help anyone. That's why no one wants to go any further. Sliding sideways with all four wheels because they're all spinning. That's a difference as opposed to just two. And it translates the entire car sideways. But once it goes down, um, then it works. Okay, now this is where the car stops and it slides and look at that, all four wheels are turning. There's a little bit of locking here and there, but they're all going. We're not seeing that front axle drag as we did with the Defender. And here's the other side view. So you can see the whole thing slides sideways as the driver just um, brakes. Now you see braking and that's to slide sideways, but able to turn there. It, the car does in fact respond to steering input. Now I try the Grenadier, slightly different line from the Grenadier, but again, it's just nothing's going to get up there unless you really send it and we're not in the interests of doing that. It doesn't really prove anything about it from the car. It would make a good video, but um, we're not going to try and damage cars just for the sake of some action on YouTube. So anyway, we come back and again, um, the front doesn't slide. There's sliding from the car, but it's coming back pretty much under control thanks to Ineos's Ineos decision to have that sensible centre lock and here's its other run again coming back so it's able to turn or able to get that nose around see that and the defender just couldn't do that from the side comes to a halt all four wheels spinning trying to get somewhere time to give it up so now backwards you can see the brake lights are on 
all four wheels s slip there and that's okay sometimes there's just not enough traction what we're interested in is the front wheels not um, not locking and you can see the car's coming down under control there. it's going where the driver wants we'll try the y62 again it's not going to make it either so it's going to go back and again under control and the driver still has the foot on the brakes second go for the y62 it too slides sideways a bit not as much as the others but you know that could just be a line thing slightly different track conditions minute by minute and it just puts a load of lock down and you can see that the car is actually responding to to turning input there. it's able to turn downhill which is which is great so patrol again from the side giving it a decent go lots of power lots of wheel spin but that's as far as it's going to go so brakes on comes back and the car's not sliding the back axle is still turning coming back under control which is great and then we give it another go this time from the side same sort of deal gets a bit further this time comes back and you see even with a bit of right hand down the car is actually starting to respond back axle locks but that's normal now here's all four cars at the same time so you can see the difference in behavior between them all So here we've got a model to demonstrate the problem and it has three differentials, one at the back, one at the front and one in the centre. Now the front and the rear we're not going to worry about for the purposes of this demonstration, it's all about the centre differential and the reason the centre differential exists is to allow the vehicle to turn like so yet drive all four wheels. Now when a vehicle goes around the corner the front axle uh, travels a greater distance than the rear axle yet we want both of them driven if it's an all-wheel drive vehicle hence we have a differential which allows this front prop shaft to turn quicker than that prop shaft and the vehicle to go around the corner and I've explained all of this in a video about wind-up. Now if I come back to straight again you'll notice that with just the front wheels on the ground I move it backwards and forwards and the rear wheels are unaffected and same at the back. Now that has serious implications for off-road which we're going to look at in a moment but we can actually fix that by locking the centre differential and I'm just going to do that now by moving that cog back and that has now eliminated the effect of this differential. Now when I move the car backwards and forwards you can see that the front axle has to turn at the same speed as the rear axle and the same the other way around. Okay so let's just um, unlock that centre differential again so we're back to that and we'll start it up and you can see that we're driving all four wheels. Now this is an all-wheel drive mode. Now if I put two wheels on the ground, look at that, instantly those two wheels at the ground are not doing anything for us, two wheels at the back are spinning and same there. Now that's a problem we're gonna, we are going to uh, discover in a minute. Um, but if I now lock that centre differential, looks the same, right? Absolutely no difference. But if I put two wheels on the ground, you see that it's still trying to turn all four wheels and you can hear the motor start to strain and that, that's a difference to uh, cog jumping out, stay in cog um, and that's a difference to when I had the centre diff unlocked so I'll just unlock the centre diff again so you can see that now that's the root of the, of the problem we're going to demonstrate what that looks like on a hill so there's something important to understand about the way car brakes work and that is when a car brakes you get this weight shift to the front. I'm exaggerating it here but you can imagine you know the back wheel is almost coming off the ground. Now what that means is that we get more weight pressing down on the front tyres and therefore there's more grip on the front tyres and conversely we get a weight shift or really a load shift off the back tyres and there's less pressing down on them and therefore less grip. So we get an increase of grip here, a decrease of grip there. Now to handle all that that means that the cars have got something called a brake bias which means that when the driver presses the brakes more braking force is sent to the front wheels than to the rear wheels and that is what you want for on-road driving because when you brake 
um, the harder you brake, the more grip you get here, the less grip you get there, so send more braking force to the front. That makes a lot of sense for on-road driving. It's not good for off-road driving on hills. All right, so here we've got the model again. The center diff is unlocked. I'm going to start it up. And because the center diff is unlocked, this drive shaft can turn at a different speed to that drive shaft. So if I hold those, those back axle still continues to rotate in the front. And the same deal there. So let's see how that looks like. We've got the very slippery slope here. And we'll see how an apparent four-wheel drive works on that. So you can see here, what's happening is that the centre diff is merely allowing this um, drive shaft to turn quicker than that, that's completely stationary. And these wheels are easier to turn in the back wheels. The reason they're easier is because there's a weight shift towards the back, and also there's the weight of the battery there, but also there's not a lot of traction here. So, whatever torque it takes to rotate these um, wheels, is exactly what the back wheels are getting and even though the back wheels got a lot of traction there's just no torque being or very little torque being sent into them and that's why the vehicle isn't going anywhere. If I was to pick it up you can see that what I've done now is I've put no weight at all on these so the back axle is easier to turn there's weight on this so this is now harder to turn so that that's where the, the, the torque is going there. So I'm trying that again. This doesn't work. Okay, now what I'm going to do now is actually lock the centre diff. So I'm going to put that there. Again, primitive centre diff locking mechanism. So again, four wheel drive as it was before, but this time this axle has to turn at the same speed as that because we've, we've locked out the differential. So let's see what difference that makes. You can see there we've actually got traction. Okay. Still spinning, but the point being that all four wheels are actually rotating in unison now, and that's the purpose of locking the centre differential off road. So now let's put our vehicle on a hill. Now, here we have a problem because remember on the flat we've got a load shift to the front when we are braking from speed and therefore we send lots of our braking force to the front and not much to the rear. On a hill when we're pretty much stationary we don't have that speed uh, related load transfer but what we do have we have a slope related load transfer because we've now got more load on the back because the weight has shifted towards the back and off the front. So we've got this unfortunate situation where we're applying a lot of sending, a lot of braking force to the front axle which hasn't got much grip and not much braking force to the rear axle which has a lot of grip. Now here is the problem. If I, remember the sensitive is unlocked at the moment, if I just brake just the front axle, I'm just going to do it by putting this pin in at the moment, um, watch what happens just slides backwards, right? It just doesn't work at all. Now, if I was to brake just the rear axle, it actually kind of works because we've got more um, weight over the rear axle and therefore more grip. Now, how can we fix this? Because we can't suddenly just change the brake bias. Well, what we can do is we can lock the center diff. So let's do that. Now, here's the center diff locked. So front axle has to turn at the same speed as the rear axle. And I'm just gonna lock the front axle again and just move it up a bit and you can see the vehicle holds. Now there's no braking force being applied to the back axle at all so why does this work? Well because the front axle is forced to tame it, turn at the same speed as the rear axle so in effect we are braking all four wheels here. So if I to lift this up for example you can see it doesn't actually go anywhere so clearly we've got braking force on the rear axle as well and what's happening with the Defender is that when it is moving forwards and backwards, it locks its centre diff or clutch or whatever L663 has in it these days, um, and it works, it works okay. But when it comes to a stop, it clearly unlocks this, or pretty much unlocks it, and allows that back axle to turn independently of the front axle, and that is why you see the vehicle slide um, sideways, sorry, uh, slide backwards and also sideways. Now it's a problem because if I turn the steering wheel like, like that, and this is centre diff unlocked again, now um, look how much steering effect you get 
absolutely not and the driver is just pushing the brake pedal as hard as they can they're not applying enough braking force to the back axle they're locking the front once you lock the front you can't actually steer and that's what we see happening with the defender so now we've got a discovery too which we can lock and unlock the center diff and that's with the center diff unlocked you can see it comes up to the stop we apply the brakes on just slides back very similar to the defender with the center diff unlocked and now we're going to go up with the center diff locked you can see we don't need as much momentum come to a stop and we've even got a wheel in the air and the vehicle still manages to remain on that slippery slope and now when it goes back manages to do so under control we get all four wheels either moving or sliding and back it goes again under control there a little bit of slide but again the back axle is moving um, as is the front and this is also a problem when parking on a hill so we've got a d5 we want to park on a hill which means foot brake on in neutral park brake then ease off the foot brake onto the park brake then transmission to park so look at what happens when we try and do that the park brake locks the back axle, but it doesn't also lock the front axle and the car can just slide down the hill. Now we can also easily replicate this behaviour in a Prado simply by unlocking the centre diff, applying the park brake, taking our foot off the brake and then we just slide down with the rear wheels locked. We lock the centre diff in the Prado and that doesn't happen. And here's a Gen 1 Everest, which has the same behavior, but slightly different. I do a video explaining all of this and proving that the Gen 2 actually doesn't have the same problem and how it was fixed. So you can watch that for more detail. Now you can see the same effect with this Range Rover. Watch the front wheels. They will lock and the rears will continue to rotate. There we go. And now we're going to see exactly the same effect of this Discovery 5. Front wheels lock. rears rotate. Now in contrast let's take a look at this LC100 and the front wheel slips but it still continues to rotate as does the rear. Now the drivers are coming down this hill without HDC. Why? Because sometimes you don't want the brakes when you're coming across rocks like this and sometimes you do and you want you to control that not the computer. So that's why I don't use HDC in these circumstances because you don't want a computer applying brakes when you need maximum lateral traction. So here's the Defender trying to turn. You can see we get a lot of push there and eventually driver releases but it's still pushing. Um, we don't have the centre diff lock too much on the Defender there because it's, it's turning. And here's another run for the Defender coming down and it's going to try and turn. As you can see, wheels are turned and it's just pretty much pushing straight on until the brake's released and then it starts to even out a bit and it can turn. So let's take a look at the Grenadier now who goes a little bit off that Defender line onto an easier line but turns and we just don't really see that, that push, it, albeit it's on a slightly easier line. Bit of a cheat from the Ineos driver there. Now the patrol is coming down pretty fast, as usual. Turns, but even so, that does manage to grip up and turn. We don't really see the same push as we did with the Defender. LC300 on the same line, modulating that brake. And we get a bit of a push there, but again, that front manages to grip and turn as well. Again, that's all thanks to the center diff. Y62 having a, another crack at it, this time a little bit slower. A little bit of an understeer there, but then the front grips, turns, and it goes. So again, we see a bit of a difference there with the four cars. And now let's have a look at all of them at the same time. A little bit is left. Left hand down, left hand down, turn right. And now turn right. Okay, defender. So is this actually a problem? Well, only if you drive on very steep and or low traction hills, and for most people that's just not going to be the case, so they'll never really notice it. But when you do notice it, you really do notice it. 
Now, what can you do about it? Well, first thing is use HDC or hill descent control. That's a really good system which breaks wheels individually with the electronics and also works in reverse. And that will allow you to come down a hill with some steering control and pretty much alleviates the problem. The second thing you can do is to use things like rock modes, which tend to prioritise locking the centre arm diff. It can also prioritise locking a uh, rear diff, which may not be helpful, but um, generally that helps as well. Also, straighten the wheels if possible, because often the more you turn the steering wheel, the less centre lock you get. And if you want a lot of centre lock, then um, it could well be that straightening the steering will help you. Now, the other thing you can do is release brakes a little bit to let the front wheels grip. That's obviously not ideal, but um, just ease off the brakes as opposed to jump off them. And finally, if you do have a Defender, which also has the configurable TR or CTR, then you can prioritise the centre lock at least. have done some initial testing of that, not as much as I would like, but it does seem to force a lock on no matter what or certainly more lock than um, what would normally be the case. So consider that in these sort of situations. Now there are two different drivetrains at least on the L663 Defender. As far as I know they behave identically to the driver's point of view but they are implemented differently as you can see. So why not use HDC all the time? Well, there's three reasons. The first, it doesn't work when you are stopped. Now take a look at this footage from Do It In The Dirt. The Everest is stopped, yet it's sliding back downhill even though the front wheels are locked. That is not what you want. If you fail a hill climb, you're gonna be able to put your foot on the brake and have maximum traction available, not uh, have the rear wheels sliding on you. Second reason, it may be too fast. What, 1K an hour too fast? Absolutely. So this photograph is of a car just before it failed a hill climb at night and it was wet. We had to back him down the hill very, very slowly. 1K an hour would have been too fast. And this set of photos is from me winching a jeep up the hill and I had to maneuver my defender up and down one or two meters to get into the right winch. Uh, HDC just wouldn't have worked for me in those situations, even if it was fitted to the TD5. The third reason is when you need to modulate the brake pressure. Now, adding more brake pressure is generally okay with modern HDC because that just disables it and it goes back to the set speed. But sometimes you need to come completely off the brakes and use all of the available grip for, for example, lateral traction and then not have HDC uh, bring the brakes in when you don't expect it. And it's those sort of situations where it's a problem. The only other thing you can do then is accelerate a bit, but you don't want to jump from accelerator to the brake. Now if you look at the 300 series, the front left wheel isn't rotating, but because the centre diff is locked, the right wheel must be rotating, and so you won't have complete front axle lockup. Now this is also why it's a good idea to use cross axle lockers when you're descending downhill, and you can watch why that is the case in this video. So to summarise, these clever centre diffs and clutches can in theory deliver improved performance through front and rear torque biasing, but my experience is that when you're off-road, a purely lockable centre diff is as good, or I can't notice any difference, and it's far more secure and reliable. And to me, that's really important when you're in an extreme situation and things are going from bad to worse. Now, this unlock problem is common across many car makers. I've seen it in Land Rovers. I have seen it in uh, VW Amarok, the all-wheel drive ones. I've seen it in the Gen 1 Ford Everest. It's common in soft rotors. It's only really a problem if you drive in certain types of terrain and in places where you can't use HDC. And you know the other thing is modern cars are really complex and it's difficult to know which modes do what, when and how. Unlike a mechanical system, you can look at a lever and go, okay, the centre diff is locked, it's not locked. Um, it's not the same when it's so software controlled. We do have more testing planned with L663s to delve into this. And finally, don't let any of this stop you driving. Every single 4x4 has pros and cons. Modern four-wheel drives are immensely capable. I owned a Discovery 3 myself for many years. That didn't stop me going absolutely anywhere with it. So I hope you find this video useful. If you've got any questions, please drop them in the comments. And thank you for watching.